Good morning. My name is Carol Dyer, and I am here from Pearson. I will be presenting to you this morning um, the second of two webinars uh, on the technical aspects of the portfolio. Uh, on Wednesday, January 11th, uh, we presented a webinar on the uh, portfolio development, and today we're going to speak specifically about the technical aspects of those of, of the portfolio. A couple of thoughts I want to start you off with this morning. Um, one is the technical adequacy of the portfolio is as important as the quality of the work and effort that students bring to school every day. So you might be asking yourself, well, what is technical adequacy? The technical adequacy of the portfolio is what the teacher's primarily responsibility is, and that's making sure that all the right forms are included in the portfolio and that complete information is included on those forms and documents um, and making sure that um, all the strands are represented and everything else. So that's the technical part of the portfolio. The development part and the student evidence part is what your student do, does with you. But this is the part that's really primarily just about teachers. The other thought I want to start you off with today is that technical errors in documentation of portfolio contents result in scoring problems that have a significant and adverse effect on a student's proficiency rating for science. As many of you know, there are three entries in each portfolio based on three separate strands of the uh, DC CAS science standards. If a student um, submits an entry that has technical problems that render it unscorable, that means one of your three strands will receive a zero score or a one score. Um, even if the other two scores, even if the other two strands score well, that third strand, the one that could not be scored, will uh, reduce the proficiency rating for your student's portfolio significantly, um, likely to the below basic level. So the technical pieces of the portfolio, which is the teacher responsibility, and the teacher is mainly the one who completes this part, um, is really, really important. So. This hour, I want to talk to you in detail about required portfolio components, and then I'm going to show you a sample portfolio entry, at which time, and after that, there will be a question and answer period. So let's talk about what are the required portfolio components. Everything that you see in this chart that's in this rose color are required portfolio components. They must appear in the portfolio. There are three strands, as I mentioned earlier. Each strand will have an entry cover sheet or a portion of an entry cover sheet, followed by eight to 10 pieces of evidence. And within that eight to 10 pieces of evidence is one, a data chart or data collection chart, two, an activity description sheet, three through, uh, three through eight, or yeah, three through eight, are six pieces of student work evidence that support the data chart, plus two pieces of optional evidence, making a total of 10 possible pieces of evidence. Now, that's why it says up above eight to 10 pieces of evidence, because eight are the, is the minimum requirement, 10 is the maximum allowable. So let's talk about what's in this what, what's in the uh, um, portfolio. Portfolio is put together in a standard three-ring binder. Um, LEAs can provide their own binders, or binders will be available at the on-site training, um, teacher training for the DC Science Alt in March, and I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. A table of contents needs to be included. That would be the first thing that a scorer sees when they open up the binder. And then there are really two sections. Section one is what I kind of call the, the housekeeping section. 
and it will contain the performance dimension determination, which replaces the learner characteristics inventory, parent validation form, administrator validation form, and an app and a uh, an optional form permission to photograph or audio and videotape. Okay, you don't need to include this form unless you actually have photograph, audio, or videotape. The second section is the main section of the uh, of the portfolio, what appears in the binder, and those are your three science entries, uh, one for each strand. And uh, as most of you know, the only the only uh, uh, grade levels, students in grade levels five, eight, and biology at high school level are the only students who submit a science portfolio. So let's talk in a little bit more detail about the three ring binder. Okay. Um, it is recommended that you use binders that either have a one inch ring or an inch and a half ring. Uh, the, the binders that have half inch rings the small rings are typically don't have enough space in them to include all the artifacts that uh, you need to include in the binder. Um, more than an inch and a half, the binder you don't have really enough portfolio artifacts um, to fill the binder, and it uh, it becomes a little bit unwieldy. Um, binders, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, will be available for pickup at the spring on-site training. Um, there will be two trainings. Uh, you can attend one day or the other. I would welcome any and all of you who are uh, attending this webinar to also try to come to the on-site training in March on the 13th and 14th. Uh, binders will be available for pickup um, at that on-site training. Um, or you can provide your own or have your LEA provide you with a binder. Um, uh, any standard binder, uh, as I mentioned, with a one inch ring or a one inch or one and a half inch ring would be uh, most advantageous. Uh, there's a note here on this slide. Uh, do not use staples on any portfolio entry contents. Everything in the binder that is a loose leaf needs to stay as a loose leaf, even if you have student work evidence that's maybe two or three pages long. Don't staple those together. Um, what we would ask is that you, you use a page numbering convention that will indicate to the using an A, B, or C after the page number, uh, that will indicate to the scorer that this is multi-page evidence. So if you're, you have three, page evidence, uh, three pages of a work sample, and the first page is 15, page numbered 15, that would become 15A, the second page 15B, the third page 15C. And this is referenced in the procedures handbook on how to do this. Um, I'd like to say, make a side note right now, your procedures handbook is your very best friend as you are putting the technical aspects of the portfolio together and making sure they are all included. Um, don't ignore the procedures handbook. Everything is laid out in there if you have any questions. Portfolio table of contents. This will be the first page in the portfolio binder. Okay, so when the scorer opens up your binder, the first thing they're going to see is the table of contents. It contains identifying information, student name, nickname, date of birth, enrolled grade level, and the unique student identifier, the 10-digit um, number that identifies the student. And then there is page numbering on the, port, on the uh, table of contents that you can use to help the scorer have a, have a feel for the size and complexity of the portfolio. Okay, let's look in detail at what needs to be included on the table of contents. Here's the, uh, the demographic information. If a student uses a nickname, what is included here? This is the student's enrolled name, first and last. But many students, especially those students who are writers and who write their name, may use a nickname on their student work evidence. So, 
this is an indicator to the scorer that they might see a different name on the student work evidence than the student's enrolled name. This is important because if the student can't identify that AJ is the same student as Alex, they won't count, they won't count the work evidence for scoring. Okay? So make sure that if you, the student has a nickname that you put it down here. Okay, the rest of this is, is pretty much self-explanatory. This is new. Now, in the, in the procedures handbook, the table of contents copy that is available for download says learner characteristics inventory. Okay? Uh, I'm not sure about whether a new copy of the, the table of contents is going to be posted to the OSI website. But if it is not, you can cross out learner characteristics inventory and just write in performance dimension determination. Okay, either way. Just make sure the performance dimension determination is the next page after this table of contents. And I'll get to that in a minute. Here's a place where you put your page numbers. The performance dimension determination for 2016-2017 is always going to be page one. Parent validation form will always be page two, and the administrator validation form will always be page three this year, 2016-2017. Also, for those of you who are new to portfolio development and submission, uh, in May, return shipping materials will be sent to each school, and in that packet of materials, will be some student ID labels, some sticky labels. You'll get, I don't know, more than one. You get four or five of them, I think, so, but probably not more than five. These are student ID stickers. You need to put one of those stickers on the upper right-hand corner of the table of contents. So up in this upper right-hand corner is where the sticker will go. And then down here is where the science strands are listed, okay? And it doesn't matter what grade, you still have three strands regardless of what grade you are. So you might put, uh, if it was a grade 8 um, uh, table of contents for a grade 8 portfolio, it might say matter and reactions. That's one of the strands. And then the alphanumeric code of the standard that you're working on, 8.3.2 or whatever it is, and the page range for the portfolio entry for matter and reactions, uh, pages 4 to um, 12, or whatever that might be. These little boxes that are here are for your use and your convenience so that you can check those off once they are included in the portfolio contents. These are required forms. Entry cover sheet must be included, data collection sheet, activity description, and the evidence, and the number of pieces of evidence that you have included in this entry, matter and reactions. You will have six, the, the number six or seven or eight, because you can have six to eight pieces of evidence here. Uh, here's a reference to the procedures handbook for detailed um, examples and instructions on how to complete the table of contents if you've not completed one in the past. Okay, so here's an example. So for section one, performance dimension determination, page one, and it will always be page one. Parent validation, page two. Administrator validation, page three. If you have a permission for photographs, audio, or videotape, that will be page four. Okay, so here's science strand one, matter and reactions, and the alphanumeric code of the learning standard your student is presenting in the portfolio entry. And then the page numbers. These are just made up. They don't, they don't coordinate with, with these numbers up above. And then the evidence, the number of pieces of evidence. Sometimes you might see something on a cover sheet that says see page six, and I'll explain what that means here in a few moments. 
So these are the critical features of the portfolio table of contents. Again, I refer you to pages 10 to 12 in the Procedures Handbook for more information on the table of contents. These are the four forms. Okay, this is the performance dimension determination form. It can be found in Appendix A as an alpha of the Procedures Handbook. Uh, and if, in fact, one hasn't already been completed by the IEP team for this IEP cycle, um, you, a, a, uh, an IEP team designee can fill this out, uh, and it should be filled out by the end of the month. Uh, has student demographic information here, and you will also be putting a student ID sticker on the upper right-hand corner of the performance dimension determination form. And this form takes the place of the learner characteristics inventory. You do not need to include the learner characteristics inventory in the, the science portfolio. Not needed this year. I understand that for MSAA, teachers have already uploaded the learner characteristics inventory um, into SEDS. Uh, and that's fine. It can just it can stay there. We're using this form for science only as an alternative this year. So you will see learner characteristics inventory in the learner care, in the pardon me in the procedures handbook. You do not need to do anything with it. You will also see some references throughout the text to the learner characteristics inventory. Um, they can. Uh, be disregarded because we're not using that form in the science portfolio this year. You may have already filled out this form uh, at your most recent IEP annual review meeting, and it may be part of the student's IEP. If, in fact, that is true, you may pull this form and make a hard copy of it from the IEP paperwork and only include this form in the portfolio. The rest of the IEP should not have any part of uh, uh, being in the portfolio, but this form can be used. If you don't have one of these forms already filled out, an IEP designee can fill it out, and again, the hard copy goes in the portfolio and it will, it will appear right behind the table of contents. We are using this form to determine how to score the performance dimension for all the entries. Um, there's two categories here, uh, performance dimension A for attainment and performance dimension B for progress. If you answer yes to the questions for performance dimension A, you will not be answering yes to the questions for performance dimension B. So let's go through this and make sure everyone understands why or, or what the difference is between these two, uh, these two classifications, and then I'll tell you why it's important. For attainment, if your student uses verbal or written words or signs or braille or language-based augmentative systems to communicate with others, then you would check the box, yes. If your student uses intentional communication but is not verbal, so they use pointing or gestures or eye gaze reliably, okay, and intentionally, and those are the two key words. If you know what your student wants because he points to a picture that tells you that he's hungry and he does it Every time he's hungry, then he has an, and then he's using intentional communication, although it is not verbal communication. Okay? So it's consistent and it's reliable communication, even though it's not verbal. And consistency and reliability are the key words here. You would check yes under attainment. Okay, if the answer to either one of these is yes, then 
the attainment performance dimension would be used for scoring. Again, just hold that thought and I'll get back to it. Let's go down to progress. Does the student communicate primarily through cries, facial expressions, changes in muscle tone, but no clear use of any kind of objects, textures, regularized gestures, pictures, or anything to communicate, okay? So what we're saying here is the student is communicating, but it is not reliable and it is not consistent. We have to guess many times at what the student wants. The student is crying. Is the student uncomfortable? Is the student thirsty? Are they hungry? Um, do, they, do they want to, to uh, just get your attention? Do they want to show you something? We don't know oftentimes. Sometimes we do, but oftentimes, sometimes it's a guessing game. Okay? If that's true about your student, then you would respond yes. And then the second part of this, does the student alert to sensory input from another person but needs physical assessment to follow any directions or um, to respond to sensory stimuli? You would respond yes there. These are mutually, mutually exclusive categories. If you respond yes under attainment, you cannot respond yes under progress and vice versa. If you're responding yes to the descriptions under progress, then you, you will not be responding yes to the descriptions under attainment. The scoring conventions on the rubric for the attainment model, and I'm going to call it a model, attainment model and progress model, are different. And so students who are attain, using the attainment model are scored to a little different standard than those students scored under the progress model. I'll also tell you that there are the, the kids who, for whom you respond yes under progress are typically our most severely challenged kids. Okay, these are kids without a reliable communication system. And by and large, there are a very small percentage of students, even within this population of students with significant cognitive disabilities, there is a relatively small percentage of students for whom you would respond yes under progress. There are, they're out there. But by and large, 90% or more of your students are going to be attainment model kids because they have a reliable system of communication, even if it's not verbal. So read this carefully if you haven't already filled one out. And take a close look at the, uh, the paperwork that you may have filled out during the last IEP annual review and make sure it is accurate. I'm going to talk more about scoring later in, the, uh, later in the presentation, and we'll speak more specifically to attainment and progress uh, and how we use that to score the performance dimension. Okay, here's the parent validation form. Um, oftentimes this is sent home. Sometimes the parent is asked to come in and review the student's portfolio. Um, if, in fact, you have difficulty getting the parent either to respond or to come in or engaging the parent in being actively involved in the portfolio. You need to document that clearly if the parent doesn't come in or, or, or uh, sign the paperwork, then you don't have a signature there. If you would just document the number of attempts, the attempts that you've made to, uh, uh, to engage the parent, to contact the parent, um, I think the benchmark, the best benchmark would be to use um, is the same benchmark you have when you are contacting parents or guardians um, for an annual review meeting. And you know, we send out notices and the parent responds or doesn't and we document if and when the parent does respond. So whatever number of attempts are uh, considered appropriate for an annual review meeting for the IEP, would be the same number of attempts that would be appropriate here. And you just need to write it on the form. Okay? Um, if the parent doesn't sign, then uh, that's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. 
uh, the administrator valued validation form. Um, there's a reference here to learner characteristics. Uh, please don't don't be concerned about that. Um, uh, there may be another a form with some different wording on it uh, posted to the Aussie website. But if it isn't, you may use this form uh, just the same. Um, and that would be fine. Uh, teacher's name, you're pretty much directed on how to fill this out all the way through. Uh, I would I would hope that before your, your building administrator actually signs this, that they take a look at the student's work. This is an optional form. This is the parent permission to photograph audio tape or videotape. And it's, it's pretty much self-explanatory. Entry cover sheet. OK, after we get through with those housekeeping forms, performance dimension determination, parent validation, administrator validation, the next piece of paper in your entry cover sheet or in your portfolio is going to be the entry cover sheet. And this is a generic uh, uh, rendition of what is available in Appendix B, as in boy. Um, in the procedures handbook, there are entry cover sheets specific to each grade in that section uh, in Appendix B um, that you may download and copy and use as you wish. You may also make up your own entry cover sheet if you would like, uh, but the uh, required features must be present on, the, uh, on that entry cover sheet. All the required uh, features are present on the, uh, on the one that's available in the procedures handbook. OK, all provide all information. This is vitally important, and I'll tell you why. Now let's look at the bold type down here at the bottom. The entry will score a zero for all dimensions. That is performance, complexity, and support if the entry cover sheet is missing or incomplete. OK, so please fill this out completely. Okay, information for all three, stand, uh, three strands and standards can be included on the same sheet. You, you may only include one entry cover sheet in your whole portfolio. If you do that, all three of these sections must be filled out completely. Now let's talk about what those things are. Student first and last name. This is the enrolled first and last name. Barbara Jones, OK? School year. In every one of these blanks for school year, for this year, for this, for this assessment year, you will write in 2016-2017. Don't write just one year. Don't write just 2017. Write 2016-2017, OK? Now. If you use the, uh, the forms that are available in the procedures handbook, the strand will already be, um, will already be identified for you. Uh, again, to use a grade 8 example, this will say, oops, I've lost my cursor, matter and reactions, energy and waves, and forces will be printed in this column. You don't need to do anything with this column. Here is where you need to, in, to include some uh, information. And this can be handwritten. It can be word processed as you wish. Uh, it, either way, is fine as long as the information is present. This learning standard piece was a particular problem in the past uh, assessment year because people wrote the alphanumeric code of the learning standard, which is available in Appendix D in the procedures handbook, it's just a handbook there, um, the alpha code. But you also have to write out the standard verbatim. And it needs to be written in right here. Okay, This is also written out for you in the procedures handbook on page 14, I believe it is. Okay, And it's laid right out. You need to put in the learning standard and the alphanumeric code. People typically do the alpha code first, 
and then write out the standard in this space. Okay. Then you need to describe the standard space activity. A few brief sentences that describe how the student will perform the targeted skill. Uh, how to write standard space uh, activities is also present in the procedures handbook. But you need to have a statement of something here that describes how the student will perform the skill. And then the targeted skill is what the student is going to do. Okay, it needs to be written in observable and measurable terms. Many people use the suggestions that are available in the entry points document. Uh, you are welcome to use those, but they need a little bit of enhancement. Don't just write the phrase that is given in the entry points because it, it's not complete. Okay? Observable and measurable terms. And um, in the portfolio development, uh, during the portfolio development webinar, um, some time was spent on how to write those targeted skills. So if this was an eighth grade entry cover sheet, this strand would say matter and reactions, 8.3.2, and then the text of the learning standard. You can take it verbatim from either the entry points or Appendix D. Um, so here you would have for matter and reactions, you would have similar but different notations for energy and waves, and again for forces. What learning standard, what would the standard space activity be, what would the targeted skills be? Now, many people fill out this form and they make two additional copies of it. And for, again, I'll use the eighth grade example, matter and reaction, they'll highlight this block and then present their entry for matter and reaction. Then they'll use a second copy and highlight the energy and wave strand and then present their, um, their entry for energy and wave. And then for forces, do the same thing. Highlight, use that third copy and highlight. Any way you want to do it, as long as this form appears in the portfolio at least once and is complete. All right, here is an example of one that is filled out correctly. Uh, the student um, does have a name. Um, the student's name has been redacted um, because uh, this is about the, the form, not about so much who the student is, uh, and it also protects the student's confidentiality. So the student would be whatever the student's enrolled name is, and then school year, for this assessment cycle, this will say 2016-2017. Now here is uh, an example of matter and reactions. Learning standard, 8.8.4. There's the alpha code. And then here is the standard written verbatim from Appendix D or from the entry, uh, uh, the, uh, entry point document for standard 8.8.4. OK? So, Two things, this, whoops, sorry, this and this. They both have to appear. Standard space activity, here's how the student is going to um, demonstrate what he knows and can do. Given eight solutions in three different categories, acid, base, base, and neutral, the student will cut out and paste the, solu the solution to the correct group. Okay, that's how they're going to do the task. And here's, here is the task. Given pictures of solutions in their pH level, student will sort them into basic, neutral, and acidic. What might be present in the entry points documents would be sort, sort solutions into basic, neutral, and acidic. This is a little bit more. You don't, it, it's also somewhat similar to an IEP goal and objective. However, you don't have to put the criterion with 80% accuracy, 90% accuracy, or whatever, um, because that's going to be reflected on your data collection sheet. So that part would be dissimilar from what you might see as an IEP goal and objective. But if you are going to use this 
as part of the IEP, you can add that in for the, for the IEP purposes. Okay. I would encourage you, if we're, if we're doing standards-based IEPs, to include these targeted skills in your IEP goals and objectives. Here is an example of this, this same um, shortened example that I gave you on the previous slide in an entire page. Okay, and what I really want to point out to you is that the learning standard, you have the alpha code and the standard itself in all three positions, one for matter and reactions, one for energy and waves, and one for forces. Okay, so you can see there's a different standards-based activity um, there for each one, for, for each strand. There is a different targeted skill for each strand. This is perfectly adequate. Okay. So let's move on and talk about data collection sheets. This is another required part of the, um, of the portfolio. And what the data collection sheet reflects is independent and accurate student performance. There are a number of data collection sheets available in Appendix B in the Procedures Handbook. Uh, you can use them if they fit the task that your student is doing, or you can make up your own. Again, there are some requirements, required parts to a data collection sheet that must be included if you make up your own, but you're encouraged to do that if, um, as needed. Uh, you can use what's available in the Procedures Handbook, or you can make up your own. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about what has to be in a data collection sheet. Again, all this requested information must be provided, or we can't use the data collection sheet. I'll take you down to the third bullet again. The entry will score a zero for all dimensions, performance, complexity, and support if the data collection sheet is missing or incomplete. Okay? Here is another piece about the data collection sheet. There must be a minimum of seven data points. One baseline point, and if you use the ones in the, in the procedures handbook, it's marked baseline. What's your baseline data? And then an additional six, at least six, six to eight additional data points. Okay, so let's move up here. This is a little bit busy, but I'm going to go through this with you one by one. Again, there's other, there's other examples of data collection sheets in Appendix B. Student first and last name. The alphanumeric code for the selected standard, 8.8.3. That's what is required. Some people choose to write out the whole, uh, the whole learning standard also, and that's perfectly all right. Okay, but what must appear is that code. We need to see it on the entry cover sheet, or on the, the data collection sheet. And then the targeted skill. What is the targeted skill? And you can get this right off the entry cover sheet. Whatever the targeted skill is needs to be included on the data collection sheet. It can appear here. It might appear over here. Sometimes we find it at the bottom of the page. It can be anywhere on the page. It just has to be there. Okay? If any of this is missing, student name, the standard code, or the targeted skill, we cannot use this data collection sheet for scoring and the entry, the whole entry, will score a zero. We can't score the entry if the data collection sheet is not filled out completely. Okay? Another requirement is the date expressed as month, day, and year. Don't leave the year off on your date. Because if the year is not on there, the score doesn't know what year this was produced in. And they're not allowed to guess or assume anything. So if you want the score to know what year you collected your data, make sure it is reflected in your dates, which appear across this, this row 
on this particular example. Okay, this, this part over here would be the steps or trials related to the targeted skill because the targeted skill is listed up here. Um, sometimes the targeted skill gets written in here. Baseline is data. Baseline data is required. Baseline data is defined as um, data collected before instruction begins um, to see what the student knows uh, at the initiation of instruction. Okay, we don't expect this to be a really high score. As a matter of fact, your baseline data should, uh, the percentage correct on your baseline should be 50% or lower. If your student can score 80 or 90 or 100% without instruction, then chances are good they already understand the concept. So if that in fact happens, then you might want to consider um, modifying the task a little bit to make it a little bit more difficult or changing the task to something upon which the student can show progress. Okay, here's another piece of this baseline being 50% or lower. If the student can score 90% at baseline, they can't make very much more progress to 100%, can they? So their progress over time is going to suffer because they're already there. They've already they've already achieved um, or, or come very, achieved or come very close to mastery of the task. So make sure your task provides some challenge for your student, and that on the baseline they score 50% accuracy or lower. Okay. This will not disqualify the entry, but there is a penalty for the student if the baseline is above 50%. So here's month, day, and year. You have your baseline plus one, two, three, four, five, six pieces of student work evidence. This is the minimum required. You can include up to eight. Okay. I recommend that people submit seven or eight pieces of evidence uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, primarily because if one of those pieces of student work evidence is not acceptable uh, and gets disqualified for some, not scorable, and gets disqualified for some reason, you still have a minimum of six. You must have a minimum of six scorable pieces of work evidence. If you only submit six, and it turns out you leave the date off of one of those pieces of work evidence, we haven't quite gotten there yet, you leave the date off of the, the piece of student work evidence, we can't use that piece of student work evidence for scoring. And now, if, if I have to toss one out, one of these six out, if I, whoops, sorry, if I toss one out, then I've only got five and now I don't have enough pieces of scorable work evidence, even though six pieces were submitted. So give yourself a little bit of a cushion just in case something gets left off, and make sure that you still have six pieces of scorable evidence. OK, here is an example. Student's first and last name was here. Here is the standard code, 5.2.1. Okay, the learning standard isn't written out here, but the learning standard is not required. The standard code is required. And then the targeted skills. Student will accurately sequence the six steps of the scientific method for a simple investigation conducted in class. Okay, this is a task analysis sheet. And then here are the six steps. So let's see what they have. We'll assume that the student name is here. So that's one component that must be present. Standard code is present. That, that This data collection sheet is scorable because the standard code is here. The targeted skill is here. This data collection sheet can be scored. Then we have the date. We have a baseline, 3, 2, 16, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 
five, six, seven additional data collection points. All of them are written out properly. This data collection sheet is scorable still. And then you have your performance summary. This is another required part, expressed as a percentage. And here's the percentage correct across the bottom. This person also included a total. Um, that's not required, but is very helpful to scorers so they can see that things match up. Okay, and then there is a, a key down here at the bottom. A plus means correct and independent. A minus means incorrect or prompted. So you can see on the baseline date, the student didn't get any correct. This was before instruction started. The next data collection date, they got four out of six correct, so they have 66.6%. You can round the decimals on the percentages up to the nearest whole number. Do not round the, um, uh, the whole number. Do not round to the nearest 10. Don't make this either 60 or 70%. Leave it at 66% because the scorer will look at this and say, well, four out of six is 66 or 67 percent. But if, if the teacher has written in 60 or 70, that will be counted as inaccurate because four out of six is not 70 percent. By the same token, five out of nine is 55.55555, et cetera, percent. So you would take that and you would round that to 56%. Wouldn't round it up to 60 or down to 50, but leave it at 56%. Activity description form. Uh, this is another required form. Uh, if the, uh, if the, this activity description form is missing in the entry, the, the entry will receive a score of one for support, but we will be able to score performance and complexity. This is really important. What support does your student need to be able to make an, in, a, a correct and independent response? So it might be body positioning. It might be something low tech like a, a, a pencil buildup. It might be an augmentative communication system. It might be manipulative. It might be a quiet place to work, a reader or a scribe. Um, there is a, a, a list um, on the activity description that's available in the procedures handbook of commonly used supports, and teachers can check these off. At the bottom of the page, there will be another thing that says other strategies and tools. Um, and be, be specific here. If the support that your student is using is not here, make sure you write it in down here. Okay? We want to know how students are supported. So don't limit yourself to just these. And you don't have to check every blank either, and you don't have to have a laundry list here. Some kids don't need very many supports, and they do just fine on their own. And if that's the case, then that's fine too. But make sure you are thorough in listing whatever supports the student does use. So up here, one activity description is required. Sometimes uh, people submit uh, several different kinds of student work evidence. Um, and they submit an activity description for each different activity. And that's just fine. At least one activity description is required one of these sheets. If you include more, that's great because it just gives the scorers more information on the supports the student has used throughout the instructional uh, uh, cycle that you've used for developing the portfolio entry. So student name, the date uh, that the activity took place, and it can be arranged. Um, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, January and I'm making this up out of, the, out of the air, so the dates I give you may be weekends, uh, January 16th through April 3rd. Uh, page numbers from the portfolio that, that show the student performing on the activity and a brief description of the activity. You can use the description of the standards-based activity that's on the entry cover sheet, and you can enhance it a little bit if you, if you prefer. But we don't need a huge amount of text here. 
just as long as it's clear what the student is doing. And then, as I mentioned before, be specific. Here's the, here's the frequently used ones that are, that are already given to you. You're welcome to check these off, but if other things are used, um, uh, include them. Here's an example. It's not exactly in the same order as this page, but everything is here. So the student name, the date, page numbers, and a brief description of the activity. Again, this is about the uh, uh, scientific method for fifth grade. Here's the additional support. Parent, the DVD, the ILS coach, uh, a textbook, a website, any of that stuff is a support for the student that enables them to make independent and correct responses. And these are the, uh, the frequently used supports that the student was able to access as well. Also check your IEP. IEP list, your IEP should be listing accommodations for the classroom and for assessment. Uh, make sure that not only do you use those, but make sure you list them on this form. Okay, student work evidence. Six to eight pieces of student work evidence, a minimum of six. Primarily, for those of you who are new to the process, primarily paper-based evidence is submitted uh, in the portfolios, but you are welcome to use photographs audio tape or videotape as you wish. Um, but all the student work evidence, all of it, must be connected to the targeted skill, it needs to show evidence of the grade level standards, it needs to be original whenever possible. Submit original student work unless there is an exceptional reason why you cannot submit original work, okay? We've been doing this for many, many years, and this is not really a problem, but uh, because everybody submits the student, student worksheet, and that's what scorers expect to see, is the originals, not copies, okay? And they represent the student's communication level. Um, here, you know, if the student has a scribe, it will be indicated here on the activity description that the student had a scribe. A uh, teacher can also write in, uh, write on the piece of student work evidence, student had a scribe, uh, to write the answers. If, in fact, you know, say you've got a student who is verbal but who has significant motor challenges and does not write. So the student could dictate a response to, um, to a peer or to an adult helper. Okay, here are the minimum standards for student work evidence. Student name. The date. There needs to be a date on every worksheet. And if you submit multi-page, a multi-page worksheet, make sure the student's name and the date is on every page, just so, just in case the page gets separated from the binder. Very occasionally, um, that might happen. Sometimes the binder gets dropped and the rings pop open and. We got papers, and then we got to try to put them back in order. That's why page numbering is really important. And if you have multi-page evidence, uh, use A, B, and C for the for the, the each page of the multi-page evidence, since we're not using staples. So page 15A, 15B, 15C. Okay, the targeted skill must be listed on the student work evidence. The alpha, again, the alphanumeric code for the standard. You don't have to write the learning standard out, but the alpha code needs to be there. And a score representing the student's performance of the targeted skill expressed as a percentage. Okay, and here is a reference to the procedures handbook. So here is a, a real generic student work sample because these look different for every student and every strand. But generically, First and last name, the month, day, and year, the alphanumeric code, the targeted skill, and the percentage correct must be on the uh, student work evidence for it to be scored. If any of these are missing, then we will not score this sheet. Okay. Again, if you've submitted only six pieces of work evidence and you've left the date off of one sheet, 
we can't score that sheet. Now you only have five pieces of scorable work evidence. So submit seven or eight just in case. It gives you a little bit of a cushion. So if you've submitted seven pieces of student work evidence and left the date off of one, you still have six, we can still score the work evidence. But you have to have six. This month, day, and year must match the dates on the data collection sheet. So let me back up here. So the dates you have listed here, you will also have student work evidence for the same dates. A score given as a percentage must match the percentage given on the data collection sheet. So whatever percentage correct you write here will also appear here for each date. And the targeted skill. Again, this must match what's on the entry cover sheet. The targeted skill must appear on the student work sample or student work evidence. Okay, here's an example. So here we have the student's name, the date, and if the student can write their own name and the date, encourage them to do so. It doesn't have to be written in by the teacher. If you have to rewrite it, if legibility is a concern and you have to rewrite the student's name or rewrite the student's date, that's okay. But encourage your students to be as actively involved in this as possible. Here's the standard. Here is the targeted skill. And on this one, it's just written in. It's okay. It doesn't have to be word processed. And then here is um, the score. This teacher included the fraction, 5 out of 9 correct, 55% accuracy. This actually is a 5. It almost looks like a 6, but it's a 5. Okay, so if we go down here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 correct as pluses. We have 1, 2, 3, 4 incorrect. So they did get 5 out of 9. Total of 9 possible responses, 5 were correct. Okay, here's another one. Student name, date, the score, the standard, and the targeted skill. All the essential pieces are here. Okay, and then you have the student work evidence. Here's a third example. Student name, the date, accuracy 25%, the standard, and the targeted skill. Okay, and here we have, down here is whether the student was correct or incorrect. This one was incorrect, correct, incorrect, 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 correct. Out of eight, there were one, two correct responses. Two out of eight is 25%. Okay, scores will look to make sure that it adds up, even though the, um, the fraction wasn't included here, but the scorer will look and say, okay, they got two out of eight correct, that would be 25%. So make sure you're recording accuracy, accurately. Let's take a look at a sample portfolio entry for those of you who attended the portfolio development uh, webinar uh, on January 11th. Uh, this is the same entry, you will see it again uh, for those of you uh, who are listening to this for the first time, I hope this will be helpful to you. So here is a table of contents. Again, if you're using the form that says learner characteristics inventory, cross it out and just write in performance dimension determination. Student name, date of birth, student ID number, um, and nickname should be on there. And then up here in this top corner would be the sticker, student ID sticker. And this will, is, the learner characteristics was a three-page document. That's why this says one to three. This year, for 2016, 2017, this will just be page one. Parent validation, page two. And so submitted, and the entry is on from, it goes from pages six to pages 14. Forces. 8.11.1, seven pieces of student work evidence, pages 15 to 24, and then 
Um, this, is a, this is a rather old entry cover sheet. I need to update this. This should say energy and waves. And then the alpha code, pages 25 to 34, seven pieces of evidence were submitted. Okay. So here is the entry cover sheet for forces. This person um, uh, separated out the, the separate pieces of the entry cover sheet. But let's look and see what's here for forces. Student name was here. This was last school year, so it says 2015-2016. Learning standard, here is the alphanumeric code. Here is the, um, the learning standard for all students, taken from Appendix D, as in Delta, in the Procedures Handbook, or from the uh, Entry Points document. Both of these pieces need to be included for the learning standard. Standards-based activity, here is a description of what the student is going to be doing, and the targeted skill. The student will be able to recognize which force is used for each machine. Okay. And then here is the data sheet. Student name, standard code, targeted skill, and the date. And we have baseline. This baseline is right at 50%. This is the outside limit of what you can have for a baseline score. So it's acceptable. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of evidence. And then here is the scores the students received. So they got 50% the first time. And then on the 20th of April, they got 75%. Uh, starting on the 26th of April, or on the 25th of April, they started getting 100%. Here's your accuracy key, for correct and incorrect. So all the pieces that need to be here are here. Student, base, student activity description, student name, the dates, page numbers. This student didn't need very many supports, okay? This is still acceptable. Uh, you know, our students that participate in the alternate assessment have a whole range of skills. Some kids need more support than others. Okay, so here's your student work evidence. First one, 420. I find 420. I see 6 out of 8, 75%. This is what a scorer is going to do. They look for the name. They look for the date. They look for the alphanumeric code. This individual included the uh, learning standard, and that's fine. Um, but as long as this piece is here, that's what's important, the targeted skill, and then some student directions. Six out of eight, 75 percent. This matches. Now we have four, four, 422. Again, all the essential pieces are here. I go back to my data sheet. Here's 422. Six out of eight, 75 percent. So this one matches. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna go through all of these. I'll, I mean, I'll go through all of these with you, but I'm not gonna go back and forth each time. Uh, know that these all match up. So for 420, for 422, we had 75 percent. 425, 100 percent. 426. Again, this all matches up. And all these essential pieces are here along with the score. So this would be a perfectly acceptable entry for, um, for scoring. All the, the technical pieces are, that I need to be present are present across all of these required forms, the entry cover sheet, the data sheet, the activity description, and the student work evidence. Okay, the, the, uh, the last required piece of information I want to leave with you today, this is new for this school year, 2016-2017, and it's called the Materials Control Checklist. This is about uh, making sure that all the technical pieces uh, that are required, oh, sorry, let me see if I can do this right. 
It didn't do it right. Just a moment. Ah, moment, please. I'm stuck here. All right, let's try this. Let's try this again. I wanted to just make this bigger for you so you could see it a little better. Well, I just lost it. Okay, let's go back up here to the top. What you have is you need to fill in the student's name, their 10 digits, uh, unique uh, identification code, who the test administrator is, that's probably the you as the teacher, uh, and what school. Okay. Your portfolios need to be reviewed twice. Once by you or the school test coordinator, and a second time by a trained person, a person who has received portfolio development training, could be your school principal or school director, could be another test administrator like yourself, or it could be another IEP team member. But we're going to go through this checklist and make sure all the required technical components are present in the, um, in the portfolio. The table of contents needs to be present, but it is not scored. So is all the information present? If so, check. Performance dimension determination. Is it present and complete? Check if it is. If it's not, you need to get it, okay, because if, in fact, the performance dimension determination form is not present, that creates scoring problems. Performance, uh, your student's performance scores cannot be determined because we don't know which, um, which model to use, attainment or, uh, or uh, progress. Entry cover sheet. Is the student's first and last name included, the school year, and then for each strand, is the alphanumeric code and the text of the written standard there, the standards-based activity, and the targeted skill. If they're present, check them off. The little gray boxes you don't need to worry about. Okay, the entry cover sheet is scored. If it's not present, the entry will score a zero. Data collection sheet. Here's all the pieces that need to be on the data collection sheet. Check them off if they're present. If you're the first reviewer and you put this portfolio together, this would be a good indicator to you that you need to find some of this information before you submit the portfolio. The activity description form, here are the components that need to be there. And then student work evidence, up to eight pieces. And are those five essential pieces there? Okay. Now, there may be two reviewers. This is all done at the building level. Okay, before the portfolio is submitted. So if you are the first reviewer, you need to find someone in your building or in another building if needed. If you're the only person, trained person in your building, you may have to find another reviewer at a different school or at the LEA level or somebody else who has been trained, okay, who has been trained um, to be the second reviewer. Uh, hopefully you will have completed all of your portfolio and combined it to give you enough time to get the reviews done before the portfolios have to be shipped. The assessment window closes May 26th. That is the last day you can collect student evidence. You then have a week to get the portfolios compiled and reviewed the last day to ship to ship the portfolios to Soul Tree via UPS is June the 2nd. I would strongly recommend you try to, to finish up your portfolio data collection a week or two early to give yourself enough time to get these reviews done before you have to send the portfolios into Soul Tree. Uh, you can always submit early sometime in May. If you're all done and all your reviews are done uh, and you've received all your shipping materials, um, you can submit 
you can submit the portfolios early to Soul Tree, but this will take some time, so plan for it. Um, so let's talk about this again. This is a required form, okay? It must be included with the portfolio. Two trained reviewers must review each portfolio. And here is the, here's the critical piece of this, folks. The form, if the portfolio binder has a pocket inside the front cover, you need to slip this form inside the front cover. If it doesn't have a pocket, you need to three-hole punch it and just put it in the rings right in front of the table of contents. Okay? Here is the link to where you can find the form. This information is not included in the procedures handbook. Um, so when, when the um, slides are posted to the Aussie website, you might want to take pay particular attention to this slide because it has the link and it has the uh, instructions for how to submit the form with the portfolio. Okay, it must come in with the portfolio inside the front cover or right inside the, be the first page inside the ring. We're now going to move to a Q&A section. Um, and following that, we're going to uh, start on Module 2, which is going to be a closer look at portfolio components. OK, does, does anybody else have questions before I toss out the ones on the chat feature? No. OK, I'm going to go through. So um, is the one-inch binder for each student? That is a oh. yes. Um, each student will have their own binders. Yes, next, each student has their own binder. The next question I received was, can you re-explain attainment and progress? Certainly. That is a funky phone in my office. It will ring a couple times and go off. I apologize for the uh, uh, interruption here. I'm trying to get back to the form. There we go. So this is the form that determines whether or not a student works on the attainment model for performance and the, or the progress model for performance. Performance is scored in one of two different ways, either either performance dimension A or performance dimension B, depending on the communication system that the student uses, how they express, and it's about expressive communication. Okay, if your student is verbal or is a symbolic communicator, um, they would be scored for performance against the, uh, the attainment dimension, okay? Uh, this and it's explained in detail in the uh, in the procedures handbook. But basically, this is a straight up um, percentage correct uh, working toward mastery. So uh, that that would be attainment. So or your students who are not not necessarily um, uh, verbal, but communicate intentionally and reliably through pointing through gestures, through head nods, or anything else. But when we say, are you hungry, and the student nods yes, we know that they mean that yes, they are in fact hungry. If, the, if you say point to, um, point to the correct answer, and the student does point to an answer, okay, they use pointing as their reliable expressive communication. Um, then they would also be scored against the performance dimension A or attainment dimension. By on the other end of the spectrum, and, and if you answer yes to either one of those, the student will be scored on the performance uh, on the attainment dimension. These students, the students for the progress dimension, 
are students that do not have a consistent or reliable expressive communication system, and they communicate mainly through cries, uh, through facial expressions, through changes in muscle tones, but there's not a reliable or consistent way that we know exactly what they want. So if you ask the student, are you hungry, and they cry, and you ask them another time if they're hungry, and maybe uh, they don't respond at all. Uh, we're not sure what their response is all the time. Sometimes it's clear, but many times it's not clear. These are our most significantly challenged kids. And uh, even within the, the population of students that is eligible to take the alternate assessment, this is a relatively small, quite a small percentage of kids. Most kids will be scored for performance using the attainment model. A few kids will be scored using the progress model. And how this model works is it is dependent on progress after baseline. So whatever uh, progress they make, scores determine that score, and then the baseline, uh, then that score, um, then the baseline score is subtracted from that score to determine mm -hmm. progress. If you look at the rubric in Appendix C, as in Charlie, in the procedures handbook, you will see how those scores are derived differently. There is also a section in the procedure of text in the procedures handbook. I believe it's oh boy, I'm not sure exactly what chapter it is. Chapter five or chapter six, I think that also explains how performance is determined in detail. But if your student has a reliable communication system, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, they will be scored against the performance, the attainment performance dimension. If your student does not have a reliable communic expressive communication system, and oftentimes we're guessing, or the student's response is just really unclear, um, they would be scored against the progress dimension. Very relatively few students are progress dimension kids. Most kids are here. So these are the most severely challenged kids that we have that do not have a reliable expressive communication system. Does that answer the question? I probably talked too long. I'm guessing it does. That was pretty good in depth. I'll let you know if he comes back with um, certainly questions. Okay. Yes, that answered my question. There is. Thank you. Okay. Okay. The next question was, how many tries before we can stop trying to contact the parent for their validation? Um, whatever your rule would be for how how many times you have to contact a parent for an annual review or anything, whatever the IEP rule is in your district. Okay. I know, I know when I was in the classroom, we had to make three attempts, but it might be two attempts, whatever it is in your district. Okay, and then the um, next question is, for those who have attended, can we set a date for the second review and exchange our binders? Arlene, I can weigh in a little bit more on this, unless Carol... Sure. Sure. It, you know, again, the, the critical feature here is, is the person trained? Okay. If your building administrator hasn't been trained or a coordinator or supervisor hasn't been trained, then they are not likely candidates. But yes, if you wanted to exchange binders with another, with another uh, teacher administrator, um, that would be fine. It just has to be the main thing is it has to be a trained person. And, all right. And then the last question was, will this PowerPoint be available? It will be it will be posted on Aussie's website as well as a recording of it. So just to let everybody know that. And that's all I've gotten on chat. Great. Okay, we're going to move forward. Uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I think we can make this up. Okay, let's talk about condition codes. We talked about this slide previously, having even 
when we talked about, you know, if, if the entry cover sheet is missing or not filled out properly, the entry score is a zero. You can see how important this is. For those of you who were here yesterday, this will be a review, but for and a good review for those of you who have, have submitted portfolios in the past. Okay, these are the condition codes, and you should see if you got it. If you if the entry received a condition code, you should see that on your individual student report. Okay, the most frequent um, we do see some missing entries. Now, a missing entry may not may be because the student has not been present at school. Some of our students are quite med medically fragile. Sometimes just to have them at school on any day is, is a great thing because they are frequently ill um, or frequently have conditions that don't allow them to come to school regularly. So it is possible to have a, a condition code of N3, or I'm sorry, of N2, because the entry is missing because the student hasn't been at school to be able to benefit from the instruction or be able to participate in the assessment. And three, no name or date on the data chart or student work. Okay, again, that results in a zero. If we don't know who the kid is, and we do not assume that just because it's in George's binder, if there's no name on the data collection sheet, we do not assume it's George's work. I'll make sure you put the name on everything. And four, okay, this was the one that was a pretty, pretty significant issue uh, recently, missing entry cover sheet or the entry cover sheet is incomplete, and it was about incomplete entry cover sheets. It was not about um, uh, the, the entry cover sheet being missing. Uh, Carol, and then we have Carol, a big, yes. Can you pause? I'm going to try and mute all lines again. I hear some bells singing. Okay. <laughs> The leader has muted your line. To unmute your line, press pound six. Okay, Carol, you'll just have to unmute yourself then. Okay, you should be able to, can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay. The C codes are a variety of different things. Okay, if you get a code of CA, your performance dimension determination form was either missing or incomplete. We can we get we score a one for performance, but we can score complexity and support. So it's not as severe an issue as getting a zero, but it, it still affects the score. Um, CV, the wrong performance dimension is chosen. Uh, given that we're using this performance determination form, uh, CV should not be an issue um, because you can't fill you can't. You can only fill out either for attain. You can only respond yes either to the attainment dimension or to the progress dimension. Uh, the standard is not one on the student's identified grade level. Again, everything scores a one if if the standard is in, is say you've got an eighth grade student but you assign him a fifth grade standard. Um, that entry would score a one all the way across. Uh, these are the other two that are more common than most CV the data chart, and it's mostly about not enough data on the data chart. If you have one of those older uh, data collection forms that only have uh, room for uh, a limited number of data collection points, less than baseline plus six, and you only fill out what's available, that's where, where people wind up with this condition code of CD. There has to be baseline plus six Scorable, I'm sorry, you have to be at, on the data chart, there has to be baseline plus six. So it, everything scores a one again. Here, not enough scorable work evidence. This doesn't happen super often, but often enough, where you don't have enough scorable pieces of work evidence. And typically it's because you've left out one of those five components. CF, no percentage score, the dates don't match, there's no alphanumeric code on the work, the targeted skill is that listed. These are somewhat um, related, but again, a CF score, the whole entry will score a one. These are uh, a few others that we 
sometimes see. Um, CI, the student work is not aligned to the targeted skill, the strand, or the standard. Make sure that whatever your student is doing relates to the learning standard and the targeted skill. Uh, we sometimes see CK, where the baseline is over 50%. If the baseline is over 50%, we cannot we score a one for performance, but we can score complexity and supports. If the activity description is missing, we score for performance and complexity, but we cannot score supports. So, again, cross the T's and dot the I's, and things will uh, uh, come together. Now we have oh, just a minute. I oh boy. Wonder what happened to my other thing. I'm going to have to pop out of this for just a second. Um, and let me make sure that I've got the right thing here, which I didn't. OK. We're back in business. All right, this next section. Um, not sharing yet. Yep. Is that, there it goes. is that better? Yep. Okay. I'm going to show you a number of uh, pieces of, of portfolios, and I'm going to want you to evaluate whether it is complete or whether it is not complete. And these are mixed. This is a test. These are mixed. Some are complete and some are not. Um, Anna, if you wouldn't mind unmuting everybody's line, uh, I would encourage folks to respond uh, as you look at these next slides. So here's an entry cover sheet. The leader has unmuted your line. Here's an entry cover sheet. Assume that the student's name is here. Um, that would, that would not be that the student name was missing. That's just been redacted. So what's going on with this, uh, with this entry cover sheet, if anything? Student name and date, is the date there? Is the learning standard there correctly? Is there a standards-based activity for all the strands? Is there a targeted skill for all the strands? Anyone want to volunteer whether or not this is complete or not? OK. This one is fine. Yeah, I think it's complete. There's no standards-based activity. There's no standards-based activity for the first one. Yes, here it's right here. There it is. Oh, okay. I see it. I see it. It's just yeah. space for the down. It's it's just space funny. Yeah, right. Now let's take a look at another one. Again, there was a student name here. The date is missing. Yeah, the date. Oh, it's the year. Yeah, the date. Yep, the school year is missing. Uh -huh. This entry will receive a condition code of N four and we'll receive a zero for performance, complexity, and support. Again, make sure you've got, this is about technical adequacy, the technical part. OK, let's try another one. Learning the standards learning and target that are missing. are missing. Yeah, the learning strands are missing. Yep, and the targeted skill. Yep, and for the second one, the standard uh, base activity is missing. It's not complete. Even the third one. Yep, that's correct. Now. But it's all, the learning strand is alphanumeric in two and three, in the first and second one, and it shouldn't be. Yes. Right. Now, the, the first one for matter and reactions, this section was filled on a different page and, and isn't included here. 
but for energy and waves and forces, both entries will receive an N4. Because they so don't have out, the standard out. written out. They don't. Well, their standard is not, the standard is not written out. It's missing for forces. Uh, yeah. There's a target and the that still is present. Yeah, and, and the learning standard is missing. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's multiple problems here. Ultimately, it ends up with a condition code of N4. And for this, for this, uh, for the proficiency level, it's a given. It's going to be below basic because we can't even score two of the entries. Okay. So two these two entries can't be scored. Okay. Here's a data sheet. Again, assume the student name is here. There's no date. Oh, yeah, there is. There is. I'm sorry. Yep. The dates are okay. It has a name. It has the, the standard, standard code. Skill. The standard skill is missing. You mean that the, the, uh, the target is the yeah. target missing? The targeted skill is missing. Exactly. Yeah. There's no targeted skill. If this is okay, this is the strand, which is neither here nor there. You, you don't have to include the standard. You don't have to write out the standard here. The, out, the standard code is, is adequate. But there's no targeted skill here. It's got the right. percentages. It's got a key. Um, but I, I don't know what this is all about. There's a bunch of minuses and a bunch of pluses, but what does it connect to? Mm -hmm. And the person, the, the person took the time to add in. There was actually 16 items, you know, 16 chances to respond, but I don't know what it is. So condition code of N3, the entry scores zero. Okay, I can't, I can't score the entry because I don't know what I'm scoring. It's not good enough to go back to the entry cover sheet and say, oh, they just forgot the targeted skill. Okay. Question. Everyone is held. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, how many items are we allowed to put in for each uh, sheet? Uh, whatever, whatever the activity calls for. That's one of the lovely things about a portfolio. There's no minimum, and there's no real maximum. Okay. It's, it's how you set up the activity for the student. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So the targeted skill needs to be on this entry cover sh on this uh, data collection sheet. Okay. Here's another one. Any ideas? The date, the, the full year of the date? The date, the full year of the date? Uh-huh, the year. It's missing the year for the date. It's, it's missing the year? Yes. That's exactly correct. I don't know when this was done. Was it done this year? Was it done last year? Was it done three years ago? And this looks pretty good, and I'm out of time, so I'll just put this in. I don't know. Again, so the whole entry pretty much gets a zero. Okay, how about this one? Another entry cover sheet. The learning target the skill. The description of the learning standard or target skill. Yeah. You're right. There's there's no targeted skill here. 
Can someone? It's okay. It's all right to have a um, a display like this. I'm so sorry, I'm but I can't. Have... it's hard to hear you with someone banging. Okay, most of our displays are are horizontal displays. This one happens to be a vertical display. Um, but as long as the information is there, scorers will use it, okay? So this has baseline plus six. There's enough data here. The standard code is here. The student name is here. But, and, and there's, a, there's a key down here. It's kind of obliterated by the, uh, the hole punch, but uh, anyway, and, and I missed it. It doesn't, it doesn't have a target, targeted skill, so kudos for you guys. I need to fix this slide. Okay, so here's, a, here's another data sheet. There's no task and there's no steps. Mm -hmm. Right. There's no steps there. There's no date with the full year? Yeah, the date with the, no, it says 16. Yeah, but there's no date here. Yeah, there's no date there. And you have but to have the all date the key are there's missing. Positive. There's no, like, positive and negative. Yeah. The other, the other piece here is as insignificant as one date is, that will, that will disqualify this entry. Uh -huh. The baseline is over 50%. And the baseline is over 50%. So, a couple of things here. Okay, what about this one? The baseline is over 50%. Yep. There's another problem with this one. There are not enough dates, not enough trials. Um, exactly. There are not enough trials. Here we have baseline plus one, two, three, four, five. Five. Now, if you, like I say, this is similar to some data collection sheets that are floating around out there. Just draw in here. Just draw in two more columns or whatever else. That's all you need to do. If you want to use that sheet, if you have those and you want to use it, just draw in some extra columns. That'll work just fine. Okay, this, was a, this would get a condition code C4, so all the entries will score one. Okay, this is still going to have a huge effect if, if you score one on one of your three entries. It's still going to push you down to below basic. Because why we have so many below basic uh, uh, proficiency ratings, it's all about condition codes. That's what pushes most of them to the, to the below basic. Uh, realm. Okay, here's a data collection sheet. There is no standard and targeted skill. Or date. Or student name. Uh -huh. And this is an authentic one. This, this one actually had no name. It, it came in with no name on it. Oh, okay. So I can't count this particular piece of evidence, but I could count other pieces of evidence in the portfolio entry if they met standards, if they if they met these criteria. So, so this one I can't count. What about this one? But there's no scores and accuracy. They didn't fill in what the percentage accuracy. was. That's what I was about to say. Accuracy, you yep. can't understand. It's not legible. That's right. You can't read it. 
And this one actually came in with no name on it as well. And there's also no direction on what the student will do. Um, no, the targeted skill is here. There is no student direction, although if there are no student directions, the student is not necessarily penalized uh, because the assumption then would be that a teacher is working with them directly and telling them what they need, what the task is. It's, it's better, it's best practice to have student directions and that way the scorers know what the student is up to. Okay. What about this one? Targeted skill? Targeted skill is missing. And okay, well, here's, on here's this, student, on here's this would the direction. standard be written out? No, the standard does not need to be written out on the student work evidence. Just the student okay. code. Okay. But here's student direction, but there's no uh -huh. targeted skill. Okay, now here's an example down here. They put a they put a code down or a legend down here. The targeted skill is at the bottom of the page. The standard code is at the bottom of the page. This person chose to include the standard uh, written out, and that's fine. Um, it can be there. The main thing is that this code is here. Anything else? Since name, the date, the accuracy is here. That's complete. It is complete. And this is, you know, I think a nice example, too, of, of authentic student work. Um, yeah. The student is obviously not cued into orientation of the pictures, has them in the right place for the most part. But, you know, some are upside down, some are sideways. But that's what our students do. Mm -hmm. You know, what we wanted to see was, was the, can a student get the, get the pictures in the right category. So, it's what I'm going with this. It's something to take the time to sit up. Or it's important to sit And it is authentic student work. Yes. You were kind of cutting out there. Oh, okay. So this is authentic student work, and it's okay that the orientation is not perfect on all of these. <clears throat> this one is a two-page, um, uh, a two-page presentation. So let me see if I can get. So what they have here is these pictures. The student can do some writing. Uh, it's, let me see if I can make it any bigger. No, that's not what I wanted to do. Sorry, folks. There we go. We're able to make it larger. Okay. okay. I made it larger on my screen, too. So, so explain how changes in the organism's habitat are sometimes beneficial and harmful, how changes um, have caused some animals and plants to die migrate or become extinct. Explain the effects of habitat change is the targeted skill that is stated here. Now, here's background knowledge. There was a, a short and adapted reading piece here. Science activity, look at the pictures, explain how each animal is adapted to its habitat. Targeted skill is explain the effects of habitat change. This is explaining how match. each animal is. Say that again. It doesn't match the targeted uh, the activity to the targeted skill. That's correct. It doesn't match. It's not that this isn't good work. It doesn't match. Is all. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. I'm going to make try and make this smaller again. I'm trying to reduce it again. Okay, it's not linked. There's no linkage. The other thing that that is here that I want to talk to you guys about is that um, unfortunately, and again for those of you who have experience with the portfolio, 
this is actually the essential and prioritized skill from the entry points document. This is not a targeted skill at all. This is, this is associated with the learning standard. So this was the standard. This is the essential and prioritized skill from the, from the entry points. I would strongly encourage you to avoid using the essential and prioritized skill as a targeted skill, because it really isn't. Okay, I, want, I wanted to make a note here, too, of the page numbering here. When you have multi-page work evidence, we ask that you do not use staples on it. It's okay to have, you know, sometimes students need more white space. Sometimes it's just a long assignment. You just need several pages. So how do you, how do you if you're not using staples, how do you indicate that this is multi-page evidence? So this page is 35A. This page is 35B. Okay, so you can assign A, B, C, D to multi-page evidence, and then scorers know that it's that it is multi-page evidence. Okay. This one here. This is what was on. I'm going to go through these a little bit fast because we're starting to run out of time here. Um, in this one, there's a there's a discrepancy in the code. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what was on the entry cover sheet. This is what, what was on the student work sample. Um, that becomes problematic. Okay, because of the 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 scores are going to use this one. And if it doesn't match this one, if this doesn't match this, it becomes problematic. OK, this one is all right. And here, you know, this was a cut and paste, I, I'm pretty sure. But here's the targeted skill down at the bottom. Actually, all the information is down at the bottom. And here's the student work. Now, there's no student directions here. Um, the, the work sample is not penalized for no student directions. Best practice, again, would, would uh, suggest that you include student directions, but the targeted skill is what has to be here. So you have the standard code here, the student name, the date, and the accuracy. Okay, now I'm going to show you these next slides. There are eight slides here. They're, they're from one entry. And we're going to go through them. This is an example. Maybe I'll just talk you through this. This is an example of what can happen if you don't have enough scorable evidence. Okay? There's a problem with this one. Does anybody, can anybody identify it? The targeted skill? Targeted skill is missing. So I can't count this one. OK, this piece of evidence doesn't count. What about this one? Uh, erasures. There's a lot of erasures. OK, there's still no targeted skill here. Uh -huh. So now I have, so I have Two pieces of evidence, but I can't count any of them yet. Let's go to the third one. Okay, this still one again, has the, still has the same problem. So mm -hmm. right now I'm zero for three. I can't count these first three pieces of evidence. Let's look at the fourth one. Is this one okay? Now we have yeah. a targeted skill. So yeah. I can count this one. Everything else is there. I can count this one. So now I have one. What about this one? Yeah. It's good. Now I have two. 
What about this one? Yes. Yes. So now I have three. This one's good also. How about this one? Yes. Yes. This one. So now I have four. What about this one? Yes. Yes. So now I have five. So of eight pieces of evidence that were submitted, I can score five. I cannot score those first three because there was no targeted skill. So we wind up with a condition code and the entry scores a one for all three dimensions. That's why it's so important that you cross the T's and dot the I's. That's why the, that we're asking you to have two reviewers look at that materials checklist to make sure all the T's are crossed and, and I's are dotted. I hope it, it uh, becomes clear that if you have all these little bits and pieces taken care of, the chances that you're going to get a condition code are reduced drastically. Okay? And that's what we really want to see. We want, want to see kids uh, get scored for the work that they've done, um, not because there's conditions present that doesn't allow us to score. We have a question. Certainly. Does it, does it have any bearing on the student score when what they're getting is the exact same um, work act, the exact same piece of evidence over and over and over again? It does not. It does not because um, when, when, this, uh, when the portfolios were initially conceived of, that we were, we were wanting to, um, to document progress over time. So what we were looking at was, um, was the proficiency. So if I go back here, um, they started at zero. Uh -huh. Started at zero, or started at fourteen percent on the seventeenth of February. Okay, we're still at fourteen percent on the sixteenth of March. I don't have the data collection sheet for you for this one. On the sixth of April, we're at twenty-nine percent. On the twenty-sixth of April, we're at seventy-one percent. Same same activity. <laughs> Right. 28th of April, we're at 100%. 2nd of May, we're at 100%. Okay, so we're seeing progress over time. Um, and that's why it's been always been allowable that you could present the same, the same work sample multiple times. Okay. Now, when I look at, oh, let's see, let me go back to... The example that we showed, um, hang on a minute, this work example that we had uh, of just the, the entire entry, um, I'm getting there. Here we go. So we look at this one, and let's just look at the data sheet. Performance was at 50% for the baseline, which was the upper limit of what's allowable. On the 20th of April, they had 75%. On the 22nd, they had 75%. And this was the push and pull. This was the push and pull examples. And now you have, for these next five data collections, the student is at 100%. If, in fact, you are using this data to inform instruction, after the student got 100% three times in a row using the same data sheet, I would consider changing the task a little bit. And what I might do as a teacher is change these, these pictures. Okay. And seeing if the student could still apply pull and push to something different. Clearly they know what, they clearly know what, whether it's a pull or a push based on these pictures. But now what could they do with a novel picture? What about something different? So if, if I'm using, and, and certainly we want to encourage you to use this to inform instruction. By the same token, if the student is getting 
consistently 14%, 10%, 0%, and is not making any progress, again, you need to consider whether to change the difficulty of the task or whether to change the task altogether. So use your data to inform instruction. There is nothing that says you can't use the same data sheet all the way through the, uh, the assessment cycle. Um, but if you need to change it, do it. It's OK. Um, mm -hmm. So I use that as an example, and it's, it's really a what if. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this entry uh, for scoring purposes. As a teacher who's responding to her students' uh, good work, I would say, well, I wonder what they would do with something different. Would they know? Would they be able to figure out whether it's a push or a pull? So, just kind of a for what it's worth. Okay, let me get down here. To, we're just about ready to be done here. Um, goes on and on and on forever. Oh, by the way, these um, uh, these slides where we've been determining if there's a problem or not will not appear on the um, uh, on the website when this slide deck is posted for confidentiality reasons. I don't mind showing them to you as part of this presentation, but um, I have determined that it that it would be better for students and the people who develop these. Uh, to show them as part of the presentation, but they won't be posted. OK, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, upcoming dates and past dates, for that matter. Uh, all, all your student data should have been entered into SEDS by last week. Um, the performance, determ performance Dimension Determination Form, if it's not already filled out, needs to be completed by January 31st. Uh, there will be, oh, this is not here, darn. Okay, there is an on-site, on-site uh, training, March 13th and 14th uh, in the D.C. area. Uh, at that time, binders will be, will be available for pickup. Um, the other thing that I'm really excited about with that on-site presentation is that we are going to be putting part of the day for you as teachers to bring in any work, any assessment uh, entries from, oh, can we, can we cut the, the uh, okay, good. Anyway, we're going to have consultants available. You can bring your uh, portfolio entry work for 2016-2017 in. We will take a look at it. We'll evaluate it. We'll let you know if something's missing. We'll let you know if it looks fantastic. Um, but as part of that, those trainings, um, there's, there's two separate trainings, on the one on the 13th and one on the 14th, same content, but two separate trainings. Uh, and you can bring in your uh, portfolio entries for review if you choose. So I would encourage you to get going um, on this as soon as possible for a couple reasons. One. We are, are not going to be reviewing any portfolio entries from 2016, 2000, uh, 2015, 2016, only stuff being currently developed for this year. Secondly, the sooner you get these done, the less crunch time there is at the very end. Uh, on May 26th is the last day uh, to collect student data. And then you have a week to ship the portfolios via UPS to Soul Tree. And here is the address, but that will also be included here. The first week in May, you should return, you should receive, your school should receive uh, return shipping packets. And that will be followed by a webinar on May the 9th for pre-submission and a high-level overview of portfolio components, similar to what we've done in past years. Um, but so if you can get started even on one strand, if you can have even one strand completed by March, and you want to come to the on-site training on either the 13th or the 14th of March, we'll be glad to look at any uh, student work you bring in or any uh, portfolio entries you bring in for us to look at. Um, I'm, I'm real pleased about that. I think it'll really help people if they have the materials 
available for us to look at, and we'd be glad to do that. Um, other than those critical dates, uh, that's probably about it. Again, May in May, and then uh, that would be for the return shipping. You will be provided with student ID labels and UPS uh, uh, shipping stickers and everything else in that return shipment. So uh, look for that, but that will be coming until the first part of May. Here are some other helpful links. Um, the general link for, test for the test administration page for alternate assessments is listed here, as well as the link for the procedures handbook. I would like to point out one other thing that I discovered actually just recently. In the procedures handbook, um, on page 23 of the procedures handbook, the closing, there's a, a, some bold type on page 23 that says the closing date for data collection for this year is May 10th. Mm -hmm. Um, that is incorrect, and the closing date is May 26th. So I'll make sure you mark that down. This is the correct date here, May the 26th is the last day to collect data, not May the 10th. However, if you're done by May 10th, it would be it would be great for you and your student and everything else coming from teaching special ed. I know that the end of the school year gets pretty frantic and hectic for teachers and for kids. Um, so the sooner you can get this done, um, the sooner the sooner you'll be finished, and um, you can. After the May 9th training here on pre-submission training, if all of your if your portfolios are ready to, to be shipped, you can ship them early. You don't have to wait until June 2nd to ship them. Okay, as soon as they're all ready and compiled and boxed up, you may uh, call UPS and have them picked up. Uh, but the, this this is the last day you can ship. June 2nd. Okay, um, here is some other information, uh, contact information. Uh, certainly your, your first line of, of contact would be your local contact, either your, your building uh, science uh, coordinators or your LEA science coordinators. Um, Dr. Mead uh, is the alternate assessment specialist, or an assessment specialist, pardon me, at Aussie. You may be reached if you have questions, and Anna Bowles. Uh, at Pearson, if you have questions, uh, Anna is your point of contact. If you can contact me specifically through Anna, if you have some specific questions that you think I might be able to help you with, I look forward to seeing many of you, or if not all of you, in March. If uh, you can get away to come to the on-site uh, training and bring your portfolio entries, and we are more than happy to take a look at them. Uh -huh. Any other questions before we sign off? Yes, I had a question. <laughs> this is yes. about the. Uh, this is. Uh, I'm going a little bit back. This is about the, the the performance dimension determination form. The form we have here, or I have here, doesn't have where we have to put the student name, uh, the date, uh, and even the student ID. I don't know if there is another form we are missing. No, I don't think so. This form is also in Appendix A in the um, Procedures Handbook, uh, and you can use that form as well if you don't already have one filled out. You, there may be one already filled out as part of your IEP cycle, um, and it may have been filled out at the annual review meeting. Um, so you might want to check there also. But this form is available in the Procedures Handbook. If I can find it. Just, <laughs> we're, we're looking at there. We're looking at the one from the procedures handbook, and on the slide, it was showing something about a student information sticker. Where are we supposed to get those stickers? Is it something that you went to school to make up, or is that something that comes from? Like, where do the stickers come from? 
No, that will come to you in the um, in the in shipment the, the materials. materials. In the shipping materials, the stickers will come in the shipping materials. <laughs> right. So this says that this has to be on here. It has to be uploaded though by January 31st. So we're going to get the stickers no, before it, the. It doesn't period. have to be. It doesn't have to be uploaded for the for the portfolio. Actually, we need a hard copy. It doesn't get uploaded into SEDS. It gets you, you need to just make a copy of it, fill it out, okay. put it in the and put it in the binder. Okay. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be uploaded. Okay. And this this says the the form must be completed by an IEP designee by January thirty first. But you don't have to upload it to anything because we're not doing this by computer. This is this is a, the, the science portfolio is a low-tech deal. Other than the SEDS information that you have to upload, uh, that you have to upload on for all students, um, this is all pencil and paper work. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, and again, these are mutually exclusive. If you, if you respond yes here, it is pretty much impossible to respond yes down here. So either so, you have yes responses here or yes responses here, but not both places. So, for example, if we have a student who the first line is a yes on the uh, on the attainment, could we say yes for the first line and no for the other three lines? Like they wouldn't have yes for both of them, right? They don't have a yes for one of them. Correct. Correct. Okay. These are also these are also mutually exclusive. These okay. two are not. Exclusive, but if you respond yes here, then this would be a no. This would be a no. This would be a no. Gotcha. If you, okay. If the student, if the student is not verbal, <coughs> this is a no. If the student does not use intentional, reliable communication, using gestures, pictures, etc., then this would be a no. That pushes you okay. down here. Okay. Then these would be a yes. Okay. Okay. Just now, again, and these are the most severely challenged kids. There are, you know, probably this is probably three to five percent of the total population that that participates in the uh, portfolio. Correct. Most, by and large, uh, more than ninety percent of your students are going to be here. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. Any other questions before we go? I want to thank you very, very much for your time and your attention. I know this is pretty dry material, and we kind of went through it pretty slow. I'm sure you were thinking, my gosh, this must be the Titanic. But it's really important. And the technical, as I said before, the technical adequacy of the portfolio is as important as the hard work and motivation and attempts that students make every day when they come to school. So we want to honor the students' work. To do that, we have to make sure that all the technical pieces are addressed. So again, I wish you the best of luck with your portfolio development this spring. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting with any of you who want to have your, uh, uh, want us to take a look at your portfolios so far for that you've got together so far by March, um, and look forward to seeing you in March. So uh, on that note, I think we'll sign off. And again, thank you again for your time and your interest in this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.